Today we're in uh, Proverbs chapter 3. And so what we'll do is we'll begin reading together here in Proverbs chapter 3 at verse 1. I'll read verses 1 through 10 and we'll get into our study. I'll give an introduction and move into our study as we continue now a verse by verse approach to uh, the book of Proverbs. So in Proverbs chapter 3, beginning at verse 1, reading to verse 10, Solomon writes, My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. For length of days and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your, eye, in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, strength to your bones. Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, I chose to look at the first 10 verses together because when you look at these first 10 verses, what you actually have is a series of what is called five couplets. In other words, the first verse, my son, do not forget my law. The first verse is going to be an admonition. But the second verse gives to you the result of following the admonition. We'll look at that for the first 10 verses. Five times he does that. And we'll be looking at that individually as we go through this. So the first 10 verses of the chapter are arranged in what are called couplets. What we have here is we have Solomon. Solomon is giving an admonition. And then he gives to his son the result of obedience. Because as a father, it is his great desire for his son to be wise. And as a father, it is great, his great desire for his son to be blessed. And so he begins in verse 1 by reminding him. He says, my son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands. So that's his first admonition. Don't forget my law. Let your heart keep my commands. Do not forget. When he says, do not forget my law, the word forget means to cease to care about something. Do not cease caring about my directions. To forget means to ignore. So he's saying, do not cease caring about my directions and don't ignore what I'm saying to you. Instead, let your inner man guard or keep my commands. So treasure the things that I've given to you. Value those things. Store them up in your heart. Take the things that I'm teaching you and place them in the treasure chest of your heart. Hold fast to those things. Now, already he had already in chapter 2, verse 1, said something similar. Remember in chapter 2, verse 1, he had said, Receive my words and treasure my commands within you. So he's saying, I want you to treasure. I want you to keep these commandments. I want you to see the value of them because what we believe is ultimately what we do. The thing is, you have people who say that they believe something, but you can really tell what someone believes just by the way that they live. It's one thing for me to say I believe a certain thing. It's another thing for me to live as if I actually do believe that. And so it's so important for us to treasure up the commands within our hearts because it's those commands that guide our life. So he says, treasure my commands in your heart. Obey them from your heart. Like the psalmist said in Psalm 40, verse 8, I delight to do your will, O oh my God. Your law is within my heart. So he says, as a father, I'm persuading you out of love. Obey what I am teaching you. My desire is for your life to be blessed by God. I want your life to be filled with peace, and I want your life to be prosperous. So that's going to require a conscious decision on your part. Let your heart treasure my commands. Value the things that I'm saying to you. Not all sons value the things their fathers say. A lot of sons ignore the things that their father says, and some sons never had a father to give them commands. And they don't have anything to treasure. In the case of Solomon, 
Solomon said, listen, I want your life blessed. Son, I want your heart to be touched by God, and I want your life to be used by the Lord. So treasure the things that I'm sharing with you, because what you believe is what you will do. And I want you to make a conscious decision to let your heart keep my commands. Now, if you do so, there's a result. Verse 2, length of days and long life and peace, they will add to you. So there's a reason I'm telling you to do this, because your life will be blessed. When he says that uh, length of days and long life and peace, they'll add to you, he's not simply saying um, you're going to have a long life. Uh, what he's saying is you're going to have a life that is blessed by God. And, and it's going to be a life that is blessed by God, and therefore it won't be filled with toil and problems. If you follow what the Lord has to say, you're going to have a long and peace-filled life. In, in Psalm 91, 16, it says, With long life I will satisfy him, show him my salvation. So you're going to have a quality of life, a life that is reflective of a relationship with God. You're going to have a life that continues and that life that continues will be a life that is blessed. Like Jesus in John 10, verse 10 said, he said, I've come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And so he's saying, if you do not forget my law, if you let your heart keep my commands, the result will be length of days, long life, and peace. And that's what's going to happen if you hold fast to the things I'm teaching you. In verse 3, he says, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. So the first couplet was general in nature. This one speaks of relationships. He speaks concerning uh, mercy in verse 3, mercy and truth. Notice that. Mercy and truth are two essential expressions of the nature of God. So mercy and truth should guide our relationships. He speaks of binding and writing. That makes them a permanent aspect. He's saying, I want them to be a permanent aspect of your character. Mercy and truth should be distinguishing traits of your life. And mercy and truth will guide every aspect of your life and will inform the way that you relate to others. And the result of this is these qualities will result in favor and esteem with God and man. Because of the way you live, you're going to gain honor. And people will see you as a wise individual. Now, I don't know uh, what your desire to be known as is. Everybody has uh, a desire. What, what do you want to be known as? If somebody is speaking concerning you, what do you want to be known as? If they're saying something of you and they're giving their statement as to what they see you as being, have you ever thought, what is it that you would like people to think about you? I know that in my case, on a personal level, before I got saved and just after I got saved, right at that time when I was 20 years old, I, I began to, to say, if there was anything that I want to be known as, I'd like to be known as someone who's kind. To me, kindness is, is a, is a, um, it's a beautiful virtue, kindness. When I was a little boy, right around Christmas, um, my mom and dad had a friend, a friend of the family. I, I to this day, don't know his name. He, he, his nickname was Whitey. That was his nickname. And it was okay to call him that. <laughs> Whitey. Because he had real white hair. And uh, every once in a while, my mom would uh, drop us off at Whitey and his wife's name, I don't remember what her name was, and they had sons around my brother and my age, and so they just lived up the street, and my mom would drop us off there for a little while. I remember some things very well, the little boy. I remember that she used to make homemade tortillas, I remember that. I remember that she would put butter in them and put strawberry jam. Ooh, I like that, I still remember that. Homemade tortillas with butter and jam. But I also remembered something about her husband. He was a good-sized guy compared to me. I was just a little boy. He may have been short for all I know, but I, I thought he was a big man. He had a bit of a belly, and, uh, but he was really kind. 
he was a man who would show affection, and that, that was unusual in, 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 my, in my time. I, we didn't see much of that. My, my dad's side of the family uh, were very withdrawn and not affectionate at all. My, my grandmother never kissed me uh, as a child. She was not affectionate. She kissed me one time. One time, I still remember, my grandma kissed me one time, and I wiped it off my face. It was just... <laughs> She just didn't do that. Was not us. That was not me. And my dad's brothers were all loud, and just was an interesting, interesting family. I didn't see kindness very often, not visibly. But Whitey was kind, and he comes to mind right now for some reason. I didn't plan to share about him, other than this. I do remember one day hearing a knock on the door. It was around Christmas, and uh, we didn't get presents like a lot of people my age. Um, that my dad was having a difficult time financially and all. We didn't get presents and I, uh, this one particular Christmas. And I remember the door, someone knocking on the door, and we opened it up. And there's this guy, you know, ho, 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 that kind of thing, you know, with this beard and red suit on. And it was Whitey, you know. <laughs> I still remember the suit. It had, it had rips in it. It was dirty. It looked like he'd been cleaning his underneath the car with it. I mean, it was a mess. But he brought in a little pillow, and it had some toys in it, and he gave us toys, and he, I remember him touching my head, and he called me honey. I mean, men don't call boys honey, right? So, but he did. I just loved him. I, I still love the memory of that kindness. That was something I wanted to be. I'm not yet, but I want to be when I grow up a kind person. What do you want to be? Well... Another thing we ought to want to be, and more so than simply the virtue of kindness, of course, is wise. We should desire wisdom. We should desire people to recognize us as having wisdom. And that's what Solomon's telling his son. He said, let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. He says, this is what you should desire. You should desire to have these things so that you might find favor before men because God will place you in a position to do so. He goes on in verse 5 and he says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your way acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. So the admonition, verse 5, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. So he says... This is something that will relate to your relationship with God. When he says, trust in the Lord with all your heart, that word trust is a close synonym for the word faith. When you have trust, you're secure. And he's saying you should be secure in and have a total commitment and confidence in God exclusively. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, not with a portion of it, but with all of it. You see, to be blessed requires complete trust in the Lord. And this trust is beyond theoretical or intellectual agreement with things that we agree with and understand. Uh, it, is, it is speaking of a relationship, a relationship of trust, because trust is relational. It, it, it emanates from a personal familiarity with God through his word. When you trust somebody, it's because that's, that person you trust is trustworthy. That person and you have a relationship and you know beyond a shadow of a doubt, you can trust that person. Now, I don't know about you. Maybe you trust everybody. Anybody who walks up and says something, maybe you trust them. You know, God bless you as you do. I don't. I don't because I've learned over time. Some people you can trust and some people you can't. That's just a fact. That's not something bad about them per se. It's simply that some people are trustworthy and others are not. And I've developed a relationship with people over time to discover that the deeper the trust, the better I know that person. So if I'm going to have trust with God or trust in God, that speaks of a personal intimacy in him. He has, in other words, developed a relationship with me that tells me I can trust him. He's not going to let me down. He's there. He'll be, for, be there for me. And I'll have that relationship with him. So it's not a theoretical thing because a lot of people speak about, oh, the faith they have in God. And there's a theoretical faith. You know, we haven't a deep experience in this. We just, in theory, we think it's true. But that's, that's, that's not the same as trusting in the Lord. Because when you trust in God, you know he won't let you down. You know him, 
not simply things about him. In Psalm 62, verse 8, it says, Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. In Jeremiah 9, 23 and 24, Thus says the Lord, Let not the wise man glory in his wisdom. Let not the mighty man glory in his might. Nor let the rich man glory in his riches. But let him who glories glory in this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord, exercising loving kindness, judgment, and righteousness in the earth, for in these I delight, says the Lord. Rejoice and glory in the fact that you know me. So trust in the Lord. And he says, and lean not on your own understanding. Now, let me develop that for just a moment. When he says, and lean not on your own understanding, leaning on your own understanding speaks of leaning on your own unenlightened sin nature. In other words, you can trust him, but you cannot trust yourself. That's interesting. But that's what he's saying. Why? Well, because we can convince ourselves that something's okay when we know, in fact, it's not. We can deceive ourselves. There's all kinds of forms of deception. The most dangerous form is self-deception. It's when you've deceived yourself into believing something. He says, your unenlightened sin nature will lead you astray. If you're going to make a choice to trust, trust in the Lord with all your heart. And lean not on your own understanding. Why? Because you can deceive yourself. You see, this world is filled with people's understanding, and it has a tremendous influence on the way we think. You read the newspaper, or you watch the news, or you hear somebody speak, and they can convince you that what they believe is true, when in fact, it is in opposition to what God says in his word. But they can say it in such an eloquent way in such a convincing way that you can be seduced by it. So he says, be very careful. If you're going to make a choice to be 100% confident, be confident in the Lord. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. In Jeremiah 10, 23, we read, O oh Lord, I know the way of man is not in himself. It is not in man who walks to direct his own steps. Lord, we need your help, is what he's saying. I cannot lead myself in the right path, so please, Lord, be the one who leads me. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lead not into thy own understanding. Verse 6, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. So the admonition, trust in the Lord. The result, he will guide you. In all your ways, when he says your ways, that speaks of your course of life. Acknowledge. The word acknowledge means make him supreme. In all your course of life, make him supreme, would be a literal translation. And if you do, he shall direct your paths. How does he direct your path? Well, he does so by his word. He does so by his spirit. He does so as you pray and seek his guidance. He does so as you receive teaching from the word of God. He does so as you fellowship with other believers and the Lord uses them to help to strengthen you. So he will direct you. Proverbs 16, 9 says, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Jesus in John 14, 26 said, But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring, your, bring to your remembrance all things that I said to you. And so trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him. He shall direct thy paths. So put your full confidence in him, he's saying, and son, he will direct you. This, again, is, is advice, commands given to a son by a godly father. He goes on with a fourth admonition, verses 7 and 8. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, strength to your bones. Do not lean on your own wisdom. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Do not lean on your own wisdom. Exercise humility. 
because fearing the Lord inspires you to depart from evil. So the admonition is fear the Lord and depart from evil. And what will happen, verse 8, it will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. By fearing the Lord, sorrow over sin and a life torn apart by sin can be avoided. Any parent in this room knows that as you've raised your children, and perhaps they've gotten to young adult age, high school age, whatever, you know that if you're doing your job to the best of your ability, that you've had a lot of conversations with your kids and you've admonished them in a variety of ways over their lifetime, and the kids get tired of hearing it. Sometimes they, they get that look in their face, you've seen it, I've seen it, I gave it to my dad, you know, that look like, please stop, you know, I've heard enough, their eyes glaze over, they kind of, their tongue sticks out, they start drooling, they fall asleep when you're talking to them. <laughs> and you do your best, you do your best to communicate to them the things that matter. You want them to know these things. You want to give them things that are valuable and you encourage them and you say to them, avoid this and make sure you do that. Uh, every room, everyone in this room right now, I'm sure all of us are old enough to say that if we had the opportunity to go back and do certain things, we probably would do them differently. A lot of people say that, a lot of people feel that. Hey, if you were able to go back to high school, what would you do? I've been asked that. Uh, what would I do? <laughs> Everything would be different. I had played sports. I played sports when I was a freshman and I stopped playing sports. I'd have gotten away from, I wouldn't have taken drugs. I wouldn't have become a drunk at the age of 15. I, I would have avoided so many things, of course. You know, did my parents try and tell me that? Yes. Did my parents try and instruct me in ways to keep me away from that, to avoid that? Yes. Did I listen? No, I didn't. Do I regret not listening? To some degree, I do. I've come to a philosophic position, though, that basically has embraced the reality of what I've done in the past because what I am today is really the result of all the good and bad choices I made, but especially the good ones, because the good ones have outweighed the bad ones, and the bad ones have helped me to have understanding about how to encourage people to make good choices. And so you have Solomon, a man who has great wisdom, and he's saying, listen, son, these are the things that you need to know, and these are the things I want you to know, Please don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord. Depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh, strength your bones. I want you to be blessed. And so listen to me. And then finally, he continues on to say in verse 9, Honor the Lord with your possessions and with the first fruits of all your increase. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Use your finances for the kingdom of God, he's saying in a way that he would approve. It's interesting how it says here, and I want you to notice this, honor the Lord with your possessions and the first fruits. When he uses the word first fruits, that helps us to remember something about the nation of Israel. You see, the key word is first fruits. It's a call really for him to remember the nation of Israel was once in slavery in Egypt. And in the book of Deuteronomy in chapter 26, verses 1, Following, it says, when they came to the promised land, they took some of the first of all the produce, put it in a basket, went to the priest. They gave the produce to the priest, and he dedicated it to the Lord, and they did so. They remembered that they were slaves. They cried out to God, and he delivered them. So the first fruits was a reminder of their slavery. So in giving to the Lord, what they're doing is they're worshiping him, remembering that he delivered them from slavery. So in the worship of God through giving, they were acknowledging his graceful provision. So he's saying, remember where you were. Remember the history of your people. And so honor the Lord with your first fruits because it reminds you that it's God who provides for you in all things. And in giving to the Lord, you're remembering that your Lord has delivered you. But as you do so, verse 10 your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats will overflow with new wine. Your barns will be filled. In other words, God will bless you. So here's the heart of this. The father is teaching the son 
to depend on God and to worship him with their gifts. It's the father in this case who's doing that. He is saying, worship the Lord. Every one of us who are parents have the responsibility of teaching our children to honor the Lord with their possessions. Every one of us do. We do it in a couple of ways. One is we do it by example. We, we honor the Lord ourselves. And two, we do it through exhortation. We teach them about it. We say, this is why we do this. We trust the Lord because we know that we can never outgive him. And when my children were small, one of the things I grew to understand about human nature is that human nature has a desire to get much more than to give. Even just on you know, Christmas, one of my grandchildren, I'll leave Stella unnamed. <laughs> I love that baby. I love her so much. She is so stinking cute. She is so stinking cute. She's also a little girl who says, at the end of opening her presents, is there anything else? <laughs> and, and then she's walking over to other people to open their presents. I mean, that's my Stella. And as I'm looking at her and I'm, I'm getting a kick out of that, I'm laughing at that, I'm thinking that is our human nature. That is our human nature. You know, we get, but it's one more thing. Like the millionaire was asked, how much is enough? And he says, a little more, a little more. That's human nature. You know, the eyes of men are never satisfied. We never have quite enough. We always think that if we had just one more thing that we'd arrive. And, and when you grow older, as you begin to grow older, you begin to realize that's just absolutely not true because the eyes of men are never satisfied. You get the new thing and um, it goes out of style and you want to get the newer version. That's the way it is. That's, that's what materialism is made up of. And so Solomon is saying to his son, listen, you need to remember that this nation was in slavery and God delivered us. And when God delivered us, he gave us crops that we didn't plant. He gave us things that we didn't possess, houses that we didn't build. He gave us so many things. So as a result of that, Make sure that you give back to him those things that you never had for yourself in the first place. Because everything that you have comes down, every good gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. And so you need to remember that, that what you have came from him. And so the Father is teaching the Son to honor God. Depend on the Lord and worship him. And Solomon was a man who could give himself as an example to a son who could follow him. In verse 11, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the, <clears throat> the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. So don't despise the chastening of the Lord. The word chasten there, when he says chastening, chasten, it speaks of discipline. The word correct speaks of chastising. Why does God discipline and chastise? He does so because we're his children. You see, God brings prosperity into his children's lives, but he also corrects his children. You see, when we prosper, it's easy to forget God. In the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, verses 17 and 18, God says, you may say in your heart, my power and the might of my hand have gained me this wealth. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers, as it is this day. So prosperity can occur in our life, but chastening does too, because we can forget him. So he brings chastening into our lives so that we might trust him as well as worship him. And he does so, because we're his children. In Hebrews 12, 9 through 11, it says, Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the Father of our spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them. 
but he for our profit, that we may be partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who've been trained by it. When God chastens you, he intends to bring you into conformity with his desires for you and to transform the way that you think and live. And he does chasten, he does spank us. There were these two kids in a park and they were fighting. And uh, a man came and separated the two kids. And there was a guy who saw it taking place. And the man took one of the kids and hit him on the bottom and told him to go sit over there. And the other kid he didn't say anything to. And so the man who watched this taking place walks up to the man who had separated the children and, and spanked one of them. And this man walks up and he says, listen, he says, I got to bring something up to you. He says, both of those kids were, were wrong. Both of those kids should have gotten spankings. But you only spanked one and you let the other one go. Why is that? And the man who spanked the, the kids says, that's easy. One of them was my son and the other isn't. And that's how it works. I'm not responsible to be kid police, go out and spank everybody, you know, go to the beach. I get bored and spank some kids. Leave your, kid, your sister alone. I'm just bored. I'm not the child police, but I do have a responsibility to take care of my own. And that's what fathers do. And that's why you don't despise the chastening of the Lord, because the Lord is chastening you because you belong to him. If you didn't belong to him, he wouldn't be chastening you. So instead of crying and being upset, what we do is we thank God because he loves us enough to correct us. And ultimately, that is something that's going to produce good fruit in our life. So. He says, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. Verse 13, happy is the man who finds wisdom and the man who gains understanding. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies. You know, I feel sorry for Ruby. She's always, anyway... She is more precious than rubies. And all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. Length of days is in her right hand, in her left hand riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness, and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who take hold of her, and happy are all who retain her. So he says, wisdom gives length of days. It produces riches and honor pleasantness, peace, as well as life. But wisdom is better than riches alone. You see, because wisdom is better than riches because wisdom yields influence, power, and, and it gains respect. And the person who pursues and receives God's wisdom will be happy and will be joyful. So pursue wisdom. The way you do it, I've been sharing with you, is just get into the word, read it, Listen, you don't have to be a Hebrew scholar, a Greek scholar. You don't have to be a very deep theologian. All you need to do is be born again. Read the word of God. Some things you're not going to understand. You know, I've been reading the Bible a long time. I've actually taught through the whole Bible. And I can tell you, I don't understand half of it to this day. I really don't. I'd be lying if I said I do. I don't. There are things that I read and, and I scratch my head to this day. And I say, what are you talking about? I don't understand that. So a long time ago, I learned that what I should do is act on the things I do understand. If I act on the things I do understand, the things I don't understand, over time, I may begin to understand. You see, it's not the things I don't understand that bother me. It's the things that I do understand. Those things bother me. And so those things bring conviction to me, and those things bring correction to me, and those things bring life to me, and those things give me direction. It's just the way it works. And, and so I want to encourage you in this because a, a lot of believers, if someone were to ask me, what do I think is a great failing of the church today? One of the things that I believe is a failing of the church is the body of Christ doesn't read. The body of Christ isn't really reading the word of God. So a lot of people are taken by deceptive teachers 
because somebody's reading out of the Bible, therefore he must be, he must be right. So get into the word, read it. And somebody was mad, they were upset. They said, you know, I keep reading and reading and I just can't retain anything. And this old pastor was speaking to this young man who was saying that. He said, I read, but I can't retain. And the older man said, do you have a sieve at home? He goes, yeah. He says, how much water does the sieve hold? Well, the sieve has holes in it. So he says, it doesn't hold any water. He says, so if you pour water into it, what happens? He says, the water leaks through. He says, you may not have any water after you've put water in it, but you've got a clean sieve. Let the word of God wash your dirty little sieve brain. <laughs> you, know, you see what I mean? I mean, you don't, you're not going to retain everything. Don't get frustrated if you don't. I think somebody needs to hear this right now. Don't get frustrated if you don't. Because you won't. You know, you won't. But what you do remember, apply it. And watch what the Lord does in your life over time. Again, I've taught the New Testament probably four or five times. And I still think, I don't get that. I don't get that. How does that really work? And there's five different ways you can look at that. Which way is the right way? And I've been studying and, and this for 44 years. And I'm telling you, just keep at it. Just keep studying. Keep trusting. What you, what you understand, obey. And Jesus said that if you obey him, he says, my father and I will manifest ourselves to you. We're going to reveal ourselves to you in a way that you didn't know before. Get into the word. Watch what will happen. Start reading tomorrow, even tonight. Just read. Read a chapter. And just let the Lord wash your dirty little brains. And watch what happens. Watch what happens. You know, somebody's going home and crying because they said, yeah, dirty brains. <laughs> I'm playing with you. <laughs> Verse 19. The Lord by wisdom founded the earth by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. And so, real briefly, when he says in verse 19, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth, wisdom predates all creation. And these verses give us a picture of Jesus himself. How do I say that? Well, the New Testament reveals to us that Jesus is the wisdom of God. Jesus is wisdom incarnate. And Jesus is the creator of all things. So when it says, the Lord by wisdom founded the earth by understanding he established the heavens. By his knowledge, the depths were broken up and clouds dropped down the dew. Well, Jesus is the wisdom, incar wisdom of God incarnate. In 1 Corinthians 1.24, Paul see, says Jesus is Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. In John 1, 3, all things were made through him, and without him, nothing was made that was made. Colossians 1, 16 and 17, for by him, all things were created that are in heaven and that are on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. All things were created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things consist. And so this is a picture of Jesus Christ, who is wisdom, and who created all things. Verse 21, my son, let them not depart from your eyes. Keep sound wisdom and discretion, so they will be life to your soul and grace to your neck. Then... You will walk safely in your way, and your foot will not stumble. When you lie down, you will not be afraid. Yes, you will lie down, and your sleep will be sweet. Do not be afraid of sudden terror, nor of trouble from the wicked when it comes. For the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Preserve sound judgment and preserve discernment, because when you do, you will know that God will guide you as well as protect you. In Psalm 37, 23 and 24, it says, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, 
He shall not utterly, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. If he falls, he's not utterly cast down. Have you ever fallen when you walk with the Lord? Of course. But you're not lost, you're not cast away. God holds you up. God holds you up. Somebody once said, when you fall, make sure you fall forward. That's not a bad thought. Because we stumble. None of us is perfect. Every one of us is going to be navigating through, through the minefields. On occasion, we may not realize that we're stepping on something that's going to hurt us or harm us. But you're not going to be cast away forever. God has a way of renewing you. When you come to him and you say, God, be merciful to me. I'm so sorry. I blew it. The Lord listens. Oh, God, thank you for that. Thank you for that. Oh, he's been merciful to me. I got out of the military. I'd been in the army for two years. I got out of the army. It was December. I ets I got out of the army on December 15th, 1972. And when I got out, I came home. It was Christmas season. I went to one of my cousin's houses. She was having friends over. My mom, my dad, and I, and some of my family went. And my cousin's father wasn't saved, but she was. And he, my cousin, the older one, offered drinks to everybody. I had just gotten out of the military. I was 22 years old. So I thought, that'd be nice. I, so I had a drink. I forget what it was. Whatever it was, one turned into two, and two turned into three. And before you know it, I had had a few. And I was getting what we used to call a buzz. I don't even know if that word's used anymore. Is that word used anymore at all? Some of you old people know what I mean. I started getting drunk. And I felt bad about it. I really did. So I went into the front room, and I sat down on the sofa that they had, the couch. And I was just sitting there trying to gather my thoughts. And I was thinking, oh, you've been drinking. You shouldn't have been drinking. Look at you now. Look at you now. And here come these two guys, friends of my, my younger cousin. And one sits on my left. The other sits on my right. And they begin to witness to me about Jesus. And I'm looking at them. And I said, I am, I'm a Christian. And I'm slurring my speech because I'd had a lot to drink. I said, I'm a Christian. And they said, yeah. And anyway, and Jesus will. <laughs> and, I, and I said, you hear me? I'm a Christian. You know, I gave my heart to Jesus. And I was drunk. And I'm slurring my speech. And I still remember where they kept sharing with me. And I kept insisting, I'm a believer. And I, and I was. It wasn't I lost my salvation all of a sudden because I'd had a few beers. But when they got up, I've never forgotten what I said to them. They said, well, it was nice speaking to you. And I said, yeah. And then I said, here, there, or in the air. Because we used to say that, you know, meaning one of these days the rapture is going to happen and I'll be up there with you. And they're looking at me like, yeah, with a can. Uh, I've never forgotten that. Here I am. It, it was 45 years ago, this month, I've never forgotten that. But I've also remembered the mercy of God over all those years. Because look where I am today. Because God doesn't give up on you. God holds fast to you. Don't forget that. If you blow it, go to him and say, God, be merciful to me. I am so sorry. I need your help. Strengthen me, Lord. I don't want this anymore. And that's what I did. And that's what we do, isn't it? And we say, God, help us. God will hold us up. And even if you fall, you're not forsaken forever. I'm not inviting you to go out and get some beer after Bible study, by the way. <laughs> I'm just letting you know that you can have confidence in him. You see, your confidence in him allows you to sleep in peace, not stirring at every sound. In Psalm 121, verses 4 through 7, Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. 
So your confidence in him allows you to sleep in peace, knowing that he's there with you and protecting you. In verse 27, do not withhold good from those to whom it is due when it is in the power of your hand to do so. Do not say to your neighbor, go and come back tomorrow, I'll give it when you have it with you. Do not be selfish. Learn to be a cheerful giver. Learn to be cheerfully generous to those who have a genuine need. Good refers to what is needed. And sometimes you will give good things because the thing that is needed isn't money at all. What's needed sometimes is simply, is simply counsel or it's, or it's help. It could be finances. Sometimes what is needed is a listening ear, your time. One of the hardest things for people to give today is their time, is their time. Some people would just as soon give a dollar than a minute because their time, they're under such stress. So he says, don't withhold good from people when it's in the power of your hand to do good for them. Don't be selfish. Give them what they need. Give them your time. Give them counsel. Give them help. And sometimes give them finances. In Galatians 6.10, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all, especially to those who are of the household of faith. And then he goes on in verse 29, do not devise evil against your neighbor, for he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with the man without cause if he's done you no harm. Don't find ways to get even with your neighbors. We have neighbors who seem to think my lawn is their dog's toilet. <laughs> Don't go pick it up and drop it on their lawn. <laughs> I have a friend who did that. Don't do that. Don't find ways to get even with your neighbors. He says, remember, if you make friends with them, they can actually provide pr protection for you. So if you know your neighbor, it's kind of difficult today, though, isn't it? It can be. I don't know if you know your next door neighbors or your across the street neighbors. Some do, some don't. I grew up in a neighborhood. We knew everybody in our neighborhood, but it's not that way anymore. I understand that. My dad bought a house and paid it off. He spent 30 years and paid it off. That was unusual. That's unusual now because people talk about their starter homes, their first home. Then they'll go into their second home, and then they finally get their last home, which is their, their forever home. You know, but that's not the way it's always been. And so in, when I grew up, there were things called neighbors and things called neighborhoods. And so people knew each other. We knew each other's families. We knew each other's kids. I, I don't know if you had a neighbor, uh, neighborhood like this where if you did something wrong, one of your neighbors would spank you. That, that, that was true. That was true. And, you know, whack. And then you'd get another one at home because the neighbor spanked you. And it would make your mom mad that somebody had to spank you. So you got it twice. You know, that's what... <laughs> That's what neighborhoods used to be. You actually knew your next door neighbors. You knew their name. You knew the dog's name. You knew your across the street neighbors, the neighbors next to them, the neighbors next to them. I knew our whole block, you know, on one side and knew most of it on the other because that's what it was like because people stayed there. They lived there. And so what happened is if we were going on vacation, my dad could say to Bill who lived next door or to Ed across the street or to Johnny directly across the street, we're going to be gone for a few days. Can you keep uh, uh, watching the house? And your neighbor would do that. They would walk across the street and they'd say, uh, what, what are you doing here? You know, if somebody was trying to walk into your backyard or whatever, that's what neighbors used to do. So that's just a biblical principle that he's speaking about here. He's saying he dwells by you for safety's sake. Do not strive with man without cause if he's done you no harm. And finally, verse 31 do not envy the oppressor. Choose none of his ways. For the perverse person is an abomination to the Lord, but his secret counsel is with the upright. The curse of the Lord is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the just. Surely he scorns the scornful, but gives grace to the humble. The wise shall inherit glory, but shame shall be the legacy of fools. And finally, don't envy the oppressor, choose none of his ways. Don't use the world as your example of leadership and power because the love of power produces bullies. Jesus said, 
in Matthew 20, verses 25 through 28, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those who are great exercise authority over them. Yet it shall not be so among you, but whoever desires to become great among you, let him be your servant. Whoever desires to be first among you, let him be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. Don't lord it over people. Do not envy the way of an oppressor. You see, God hates the abuse of power, and God deals with them over time. We're to be just, and we're to be humble, and the result of that is an inheritance of honor. Notice in verse 32 how his secret counsel is with the upright. His secret counsel is with the upright. That reminds me of what Jesus said in John 15, verses 14 and 15. He said, you are my friends if you do whatever I command you. No longer do I call you servants. The servant doesn't know what his master is doing. I've called you friends. For all things that I heard from my father, I've made known to you. His secret counsel is revealed to those who walk with him. And finally, in verse 34, he scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble. God resists those who are proud in their own eyes, but he ministers the do to those who trust him. God has a way, by the way, and you've learned this. I have too. Hey, I learn it. It's not something I've learned forever. I have to learn it often. Uh, if you think you're something, you'll discover you're nothing. You do. If you think you're special, the Lord reminds you of how you're really not. And he's very kind when he does it, but he does it, you know. And uh, what I've asked the Lord to do, and he's been very faithful at this, is I've asked him, can you help me to be humble? <laughs> and he says, sure, why not? And he does. And he's given me lots of opportunities to be humbled. I remember one, I could give you a lot of them. I'll give you one. Um, you know, I, I love my pastor Chuck with all of my heart. And, and many, many years ago now, I was at a pastor's conference and uh, Chuck was walking past me at the conference. And I had some of my friends with me. And as Chuck walked by, I said, hi, Chuck, how you doing? And he looks at me and he says, hi, Don. He goes, I've been praying for you. And I smiled. And as he walked by, I turned to the guy with me and I said, some guy named Don is being blessed right now. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but it's not me. He has a way of humbling you. God is very gracious to do that. So, so remember in verse 34, he scorns the scornful but gives grace to the humble.